Or it will be 2021. I could not be happier. I bet a lot of you feel the same way. We are so ready to kick 2020 out the door. And uh, I just am feeling totally energized that uh, the new year is going to be here and great things are going to happen. Tonight is going to be very special. Uh, don't believe any doubting Thomases that say because there's not going to be a million people or more in Times Square that it's not going to be special. It's going to be actually arguably the most special, the most poignant, the most moving New Year's Eve. Everyone watch on television. Don't go down there. Watch from home. But it's going to be powerful. And think about it. We're going to be honoring our healthcare heroes and first responders and folks who did amazing work this year, folks from the Cure Violence Movement who did great work this year. Uh, all out there, small group observing the festivities and enjoying the festivities, but they'll be the people we truly have in our hearts because they're the folks who saw us through this year. But think about the performers too, amazing cast of performers. New York City's own, the Bronx's own, Jennifer Lopez, there's for the Bronx. This is a great moment to have her highlighted uh, as we bring in the new year. And my personal favorite, Gloria Gaynor will be singing I will survive. I can't think of a more amazing, special, and appropriate song for this occasion. Uh, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be very powerful, very special. Everyone tune in. I guarantee you that Sherlane and I will push the button on time. In fact, we will be tempted to push the button early and start the new year early, but we will get there for sure. 2021 right around the corner, and we're going to do great things in 2021. I want to talk about that today. I want to start with the most important New Year's resolution I could possibly offer you in the month of January 2021, we will vaccinate a million New Yorkers, a million people we will reach in January. This city can do it. The amazing healthcare professionals of this city are ready. We're going to set up new sites all over the city on top of the many, many sites that are already operational. We're going to expand from our hospitals and our clinics to community clinics to locations we'll set up all over the neighborhoods of the city. Our goal is to get to upwards of 250 locations citywide. This is going to be a massive effort. This is going to be part of the largest single vaccination effort in the history of New York City. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take tremendous urgency and focus, and we will need help from the federal government. We will need help from the state government. We will need help from the vaccine manufacturers. But we're making clear to the whole world, we can achieve a million vaccinations in January. We get that help, we'll make it happen. We have the ability to make it happen on the ground, and we are anxious to get it done. Look, President-elect Biden said it right. This whole country is behind the pace it needs to be. Uh, we're going to need to go faster to beat back the coronavirus, to restart our economy, to protect people's lives, to recover. We've got to go faster. New York City will lead the way. We have the will. We have the sense of urgency. We have the capacity. We have the know-how. This is a chance for New York City to shine and help achieve the president-elect's goal. It is so clear that there's no reason, there's no reason for anything but urgency at this point and that every single person we reach takes us one step closer to recovery. Now, we are doing better than most of the country. That's the good news. But we're nowhere near where we need to be. 88,000 New Yorkers have been vaccinated so far. That's great. 88,000 people is nothing to sneeze at. But we need to go into overdrive now. Uh, we need every day uh, to speed up and reach more and more people. And we're committed to doing that. So uh, we know that we have the ability uh, we're going to do this with a really decentralized grassroots effort. We're going to go all over the city. We're going to create new uh, hubs of activity. So number one, new COVID vaccine hubs will be created all around the city on top of the locations we have. Uh, two, test and trace sites will start to be locations for vaccination as well. Test and trace has been very successful, reaching to every corner of the city protecting people. We're going to take that same capacity, use it to help us achieve more vaccinations. And three, we're going to scale up the capacity of local organizations that can do this work. We have so many tremendous partners on the ground, so many community-based organizations that can be part of this and have the ability to reach people, move people, motivate people. They're going to be a part of this in a big way. So all of this will be coordinated by our vaccine command center. A lot of moving parts. 
but we can get it done. Again, we need the federal government to be there with us, to be committed to this goal, to help us achieve it, to give us flexibility. We need the state government to work with us to keep this moving. We need the manufacturers to keep providing the doses. But that can be done. All those things can be done, and we're going to make together something very special happen here. What we will not allow to happen in New York City is for people to jump the line, use their wealth or their privilege to get vaccines that they should not be getting. We're already seeing this, unfortunately, around the country. Congressional staffers jumping the line, even if they're not in a category that should be a priority. We're seeing pharmaceutical company executives jumping the line. We want the people who need the vaccine most to get it first. And we're going to stick to those priorities and we're going to be aggressive about it. So right now, of course, the focus on healthcare workers, the folks who have kept us safe, our heroes who we need the most to keep safe going forward, focus on nursing home staff and residents. We're going to keep building out from there faster and faster, but we're going to make sure the distribution is based on equity and fairness. And as we get out into communities, that we focus on the communities hardest hit that unfortunately bore the brunt. It had the most cases, they had the most deaths and have the most need. So we can do it, New York City, all of us together, and the person who's going to help us to lead the way with the incredible effort of his team, uh, the health department, and they have a lot of great history, a lot of great success historically in vaccinations. Uh, very, very proud to introduce on this auspicious day our health commissioner, Dr. Dave Choksi. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Well, beating a virus is a team sport and we need every position on the field to come together. I saw this in such a poignant way yesterday when I visited a nursing home in my neighborhood in Queens. Residents and staff alike were getting vaccinated. I heard one resident say she couldn't wait to get her shot, but she asked her regular nurse to stay by her side while she was getting it for moral support. These are the small and large ways our healthcare heroes have quite literally moved the needle for the past couple of weeks, resulting in over 88,000 vaccinations to date. But we will need to further accelerate our efforts to turn vaccines into vaccinations. One key to doing this, as the mayor mentioned, is expanding points of access across our entire city. Our goal is to double the access points for vaccination within a month, from hospitals to community health centers to urgent care clinics, totaling at least 250 sites across the five boroughs. Part of our strategy includes launching the first dedicated city vaccine hubs in the coming weeks. These are city-operated vaccination clinics uh, stood up rapidly as points of distribution in school gymnasiums and other sites. The first sites will launch in mid-January, administering 45,000 doses per week with plans to expand over time if we get adequate supply of vaccine. We are picking the locations of these sites to help ensure access in our priority neighborhoods for the places and the people who have been hardest hit by this vicious virus, most often communities of color. In addition, the city has built an unprecedented testing apparatus through the Test and Trace Corps that can also be leveraged to administer vaccines at certain sites, again with a focus on hardest hit communities. Finally, the most essential partners have always been community organizations. Activating them by providing nurses and pharmacists to vaccinate on site in communities will provide capacity for several tens of thousands of vaccinations per week by the end of January. This is the kind of thing we do every year during flu season, supporting events at churches and community centers, but this would be like our flu campaign in overdrive. Growing capacity through these initiatives, along with our existing hospital, clinic, and pharmacy infrastructure, gets us to the ability to administer a total of one million doses by the end of January. I do want to specify that these are aggressive goals. And this historic vaccination campaign is a team sport, as I mentioned. We'll need blocking and tackling to run at the pace that we want from a number of partners, but particularly our colleagues in state and federal government. Swiftly extending guidance on the populations eligible for vaccination is particularly important 
from hospital workers and nursing homes to other healthcare workers, first responders, and of course, our seniors. And we need a sufficient supply of vaccine with a clear roadmap of what New York City can expect to receive from the federal government, not just for next week, but for the months ahead. But if these elements of the game plan come together, we can move fast and travel far. Finally, we need New Yorkers themselves to choose to get vaccinated. But we'll help you by making sure your vaccine questions get answered, endeavoring to dispel misinformation, and doubling our access points to make it more convenient for you. Mr. Mayor, it's a particular honor for me to be able to join you on this last day of 2020. I wanted to conclude uh, with some brief tailored messages. To my fellow healthcare workers, thank you so much for all you have done during this really tough year. But if you've gotten your vaccine, I have one more task for you. Be sure to tell the story of why you got vaccinated and reach out to people who may still have unanswered questions. Our website, nyc.gov slash COVID vaccine has the resources you need. To hospital leaders, COVID-19 is not taking the weekend off. So I strongly urge you to schedule vaccination clinics over the weekend too. And to all New Yorkers, I remain quite concerned by the increase in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths across our beloved city. It's not too late to cancel your New Year's Eve gathering plans and stay safe by staying home. And finally, to the year 2020, good riddance. I'm looking forward to a better year ahead. <laughs> Well said, Dave. Uh, listen, I want to say to our Commissioner Dave Toxie, thank you for your extraordinary work this year, for your team's amazing work. Uh, some of the other colleagues here uh, as part of this press conference today, Deputy Mayor Melanie Hartzog and Senior Advisor Jay Varma and CEO of Health and Hospitals Mitch Katz, you've all been heroes this year. You really have been. You're, you're all very modest people, so maybe I'm making you blush. But uh, the fact is, all of you have been heroes of 2020. All of you are going to be part of the history of this city, and you're going to be in the history books as people who made a tremendous positive difference for the people of New York City and your whole teams. Thank you, and I'm thanking you. I'm thanking you as individuals, but I'm also thanking you for the amazing teams you've assembled and the amazing work you've all done. And listen, talking about team, I'm going to pick up right where Dave started talking about team. This is going to be a team effort to reach 1 million vaccinations in January. Uh, we're going to work with the whole community. We're going to work with the whole healthcare world. We're also going to call all city agencies to be part of this. So, as Dave mentioned, you know, you talk about a school gymnasium, Department of Education is going to be a part of this. Think about public housing, NYCHA, our community centers. Uh, we're going to be out there in NYCHA developments over the months ahead. They're going to be a crucial piece of this as well. Uh, we are going to focus intensely on the communities that need help the most, the communities that bore the brunt, and our public housing residents certainly bore the brunt of this crisis. So in January and beyond, you're gonna see this grow, be more and more grassroots, more and more people getting involved, leaders, agencies, institutions, parts of the community, you name it. This is going to be an extraordinary effort. I wanna do a special thank you uh, to the state of New York. We've been working really closely with our state partners over these last weeks determining how to do something that's never been done before. This is a brand new vaccine, brand new type of vaccine. We've had to be really smart and careful about getting it implemented. We've been working well with the state to figure out the steps, and we're working together to figure out how to do this as quickly as humanly possible. So thank you to everyone, the state government, who's worked so hard throughout this year. Uh, Governor Cuomo, his whole team, we appreciate all the work we've done together. And uh, we are going to, together, find a way to push harder, and we're all together gonna to push the federal government to do its share and the manufacturers to do their share so we can really go into overdrive here. All right, now, there's a lot of good news ahead, a lot of good news ahead. 2021 is gonna be a good news year, but 2020 is gonna go down in history as one of our saddest, toughest years, arguably the toughest year in the history of New York City. Thank God we all came through, those of us who made it, but we gotta remember those who didn't make it. We gotta remember those we lost. And we gotta be there with their families every day. Uh, all the families who lost loved ones, my heart goes out to you. You're in our thoughts and prayers all the time. We know this has just been a incredibly difficult 
to go through this pain without the chance to mourn in so many cases, without the chance to be with loved ones. So uh, it's important that we have a day of remembrance. It's important that we have a day going forward in the future of the city to always remember what happened in 2020, to remember those we lost, to honor them, to honor their families, and of course, at the same time, remember all the heroism, all the people who did so much good to protect people. The day we lost our first New Yorker to COVID uh, in this year was March 14th, 2020. Next March 14th, 2021, will be a day of remembrance in New York City. We need to recognize 25,000 of our fellow New Yorkers gone. Uh, that's something we have to always mark going forward. And we got to remember them by, one, being there for their families, by, two, honoring those who did so much to try to save them, and, three, by working to make this city better all the time in their memory. So many we lost were victims of the disparities and inequality in our society. And this is not a shocking statement to anyone who's been watching. Uh, so many people we lost had never gotten enough health care in their lives and didn't get their fair share no matter how hard they worked. So many people we lost were victims of still too much discrimination and racism in our society. We lost people of every background. We lost people of every income level, every neighborhood. This tragically was a disease that affected everyone, but it did not affect everyone equally. So on March 14th each year, we remember also the painful lessons we learned, but it's a time to rededicate ourselves to making a difference and changing things. Day to look back, but it'll always also be a day to look forward and say, how can we do better so we never lose people again? And we have a city that is there for everyone going forward. So before I now move forward to what we do every single day, which is our daily indicators, I do want to take a moment, since it's a very special time of year. Obviously, we've had holidays of many faith traditions, Christmas and Hanukkah, and so many important holidays that people have celebrated so many times when people restored faith and hope. Uh, and we, of course, are looking forward to tonight and tomorrow, but here we are still in Kwanzaa, and it's so good to talk about Kwanzaa and the Kwanzaa principles. And this is something we're really highlighting this year. We're going to do in a very big way next year because these principles say so much to us, so much positive, so much helpful, and that is really moves us forward and helps us think about where we need to go. Uh, each day, uh, at the beginning of the day, the phrase habaragani, which means what's the news? And then the answer is the principle of that day. Today is kumba, and that means creativity. And uh, I want to celebrate uh, the creativity of New Yorkers, the resourcefulness, the ingenuity of New Yorkers in the year 2020. It was unbelievable. The things people did this year to help each other. Uh, talk about making a way where there's no way. Uh, in the year 2020, New Yorkers had to create like never before. Well, whether you're talking about what our healthcare heroes had to do to protect people and, and save our hospital system and our first responders, what they had to do and the incredible challenges they overcame, whether you're talking about the way this city ended up creating its own ventilators, its own PPE, its own uh, processing labs for tests, things we didn't have before. We created them all here, New York City know-how, and we did it in record time. That's what New York City is all about and just the way people helped each other and the way people expressed their own personalities, their own hope, their own belief, whether it was design of a face mask or the ways people celebrated and supported each other, the cultural activities put together to support people, give them hope. Uh, this was a year for creativity if ever there was one. So uh, a lot to be proud of when it comes to the creativity of our people and we're gonna see it blossom in 2021. Now we're going to go to our indicators. I'm going to, again, as we go through indicators, put a bit of a qualifier on that uh, we've seen some pretty aberrant numbers the last few days. Uh, we obviously had the situation with a lot of people getting tested in advance of the holidays, and then during the holidays, test numbers were uneven, so you get a different kind of sample. But that being said, uh, even though these numbers look somewhat skewed, they are still very cautionary. It's important we focus on them. So... 
First, uh, number one daily number of people admitted at New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 199 patients. Obviously, the goal is 200, so we're just there. We want to drive that down. Hospitalization rate per 100,000, still way too high, 3.93. We want to get that back under two. Uh, number two, daily number of new cases for COVID-19, seven-day average. Today's number 3,259, way too high against the goal of 550. And number three, percentage of New York City residents testing positive for COVID-19, seven-day rolling average, very high number today, 8.87%. Again, that, that is probably aberrant based on uh, uneven testing with the holidays, but still cautionary and troublesome and something we need to focus on, something we all need to act on. We want to get that number below 5% and keep driving it down. So what can you do? You just heard your doctor, the people's doctor, tell you uh, if you're thinking about going to some kind of large holiday gathering tonight, just don't do it. I will borrow from Nike and modify the phrase, just don't do it. It's, uh, it doesn't make sense. Next year, you'll be able to celebrate all you want if we get this right. But if people keep getting sick because of doing the wrong thing, it's not going to speed our days of recovery, to say the least. So please, avoid large gatherings tonight. Keep it small. Keep it simple. Stay home. Stay close. Let's be healthy. Let's help each other. A few words in Spanish. Mañana empieza un nuevo año en el que unidos vamos a vencer al coronavirus de una vez por todas. En enero queremos vacunar a un millón de neoyorquinos y con trabajo fuerte lo vamos a lograr. Derrotar al virus pronto es nuestra meta más grande. Y entre todos vamos a lograr en que nuestra ciudad gane esta batalla. With that and feliz año nuevo while I'm at it. With that, let's turn to our colleagues in the media. Please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we're joined today by Dr. Choksi, by Deputy Mayor Melanie Hartzog, by Dr. Katz, and by Senior Advisor Dr. Jay Varma. The first question today goes to Hazel Sanchez from WCBS. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year, Hazel. How you feel? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Um, you've probably seen that video uh, of a group of bicyclists attacking a man and his mother inside his SUV. Uh, I spoke with the driver, Max Turgovnik. He's a lifelong New York City resident, and he says he feels he deserves answers from the city as to what allowed this to happen, and what is the city going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again? Hazel, it's absolutely unacceptable. And, you know, you have these teenagers doing something that's just wrong, period. Uh, at least one has been arrested. The others will be. Uh, look, we got to teach our young people uh, better all the time. It's incumbent upon all of us. But we also have to have consequences. So there will be consequences in this case. I don't want to ever see anything like this happen in New York City. Go ahead, Hazel. And getting back to the uh, vaccinations, you're, you're launching an aggressive campaign to vaccinate New Yorkers in January. Why wasn't this kind of plan ready to be rolled out in December when you knew the vaccine would be arriving? Hazel, uh, what we said from the beginning was uh, we were going to get this right. Uh, our doctors have spoken about this many times. This was a brand new vaccine with realities we never experienced before, including the need, the need for ultra cold refrigeration and very tight standards about how it could be utilized. One of the things we're saying here is that we need the federal government to really be committed to speeding this process and looking at all those standards. We want everyone to be safe, but we have to have a focus on speed and urgency. So the first weeks were about getting it right, making sure everything was safe and proper, uh, but we knew we wanted to go a hell of a lot faster. So I'm perfectly comfortable at the first weeks were about really testing to make sure everything worked right. And you've seen the results. Uh, people have been getting these uh, vaccinations safely, effectively. Uh, we've had very, very few side effects. We've had a very successful experience. We've shown the world that. Now it is time to take off. Now it is time to race. And we're ready to do it. Go ahead. The next is Matt Chase from Newsday. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Happy New Year, early. Happy, happy New Year, Matt. How you feel? I'm doing okay. How about yourself? 
I am ecstatic. Can't, I've been dreaming Excellent. of this day. Excellent. You, you love to hear it. Um, uh, under your NYC vaccine for all campaign, will the vaccination itself be available to a person in one of those 27 neighborhoods at a greater rate, on a faster timeline, or in any different way whatsoever than a person not in those 27 neighborhoods, yes or no? So first, let me frame it. We're going to follow, of course, the guidelines that originate with the federal government and then are codified by the state. And we're going to work with the state to keep expanding those guidelines constantly. So to get to the point where we're talking about everyday people, like senior citizens, folks with pre-existing conditions, that still, of course, has to happen within the state guidelines. But we're going to work with the state to speed that along because we want to be able to always jump ahead to the next group of people when we find there's more vaccine available and we have gone through one group, we want to immediately move on to the next group. So we, we need that uh, state guidance to do that always. But the bottom line is we're going to make sure that the priority neighborhoods get the vaccine when it is for the general public. They have to be the first wave because they're where the most people suffered. There were the most cases, there were the most deaths. By definition, that's where you need to protect people the most. Go ahead, Matt. I have another question, but I do need to stay on this one. You say that they have to be the first wave. Will they be the first wave in New York City? Yeah, that we've been saying that for weeks and weeks. Where, Matt, let me, let me flip the equation here. Where else would you go but where the need is greatest? Of course, when it comes to going out to the grassroots, we're going to go to the places that suffered the most and are still the most vulnerable. Absolutely. Go ahead. The next is Samantha Liebman from 1010 Wins. Hi, good morning, Mr. Mayor, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. How are you doing today? So, I'm good. How are you? I couldn't be better. <laughs> so, um, let me ask you on a personal note. I know you said that the New Year's resolution was going to be to get those million vaccines next month. But, but on a personal note, do you have any resolutions? Uh all I can tell you is I want to make 2021 an amazing year in New York City. Uh, I have so much energy right now. I'm going to burn my way to the finish line uh, this year. And on December 31st, 2021, we're going to look back and say we did amazing things in New York City in 2021. We turned the tide. We started our recovery. Uh, we reached people and protected people in ways never seen before. That's my resolution. I feel very, very confident we can do that. Look, a million is a big goal. I want to be clear about this. Saying out loud, this was not something we did lightly. Saying out loud, and I'm going to say it again, our goal is to vaccinate one million New Yorkers in the month of January 2021. That's a very big goal. That's a very tough goal. That's a very ambitious goal, but it's a necessary goal. And all we're saying to everyone else out there that we rely on is join us and we can do it. We are going to drive and drive and drive, and we're going to get this done. Go ahead. I know you spoke about this on CNN already, but um, have you gotten a chance to see the new video that the NYPD put out about the incident at the Arlo Hotel? And can you talk a little bit more about what you think should happen to this woman? Yeah, this has to end. Um, the, uh, I have not seen the new video, but I'll tell you the bottom line on this. We've seen a series of things like this around the country. Um, it's almost become tragically comical how much you can rely on the fact that someone will unjustly accuse a young man of color in America. I mean, it's just crazy. It's very personal for me. I have a son of color uh, who is about as good a human being as you could possibly imagine, and yet I know he will be looked down on and disrespected throughout his life and it's not fair, and it's not right, and it has to end. But it's also just, it's destructive. Uh, you know what? Think about this, and I have this experience as a father. What do you do as a parent? You try and give your child hope and faith and, and a belief in themselves, self-esteem, and that, a sense of belonging. If you're a young black man or any young man of color in America, and you're looked down on and treated like there's something wrong with you, how are you going to succeed? How are you going to believe? 
in yourself. How are you going to believe your society is going to be fair to you? This, this is why we got rid of stop and frisk, the broken approach to stop and frisk that was used year ago, years ago, because it was denigrating to young people of color, certainly young women as well, but particularly young men of color. It was denigrating. It was taking away their self-esteem. How do you build a better city and a better country if you're robbing the majority of our people of their self-esteem? So uh, this just has to end. And the way for it to end is for every one of us to condemn it, to not accept it in our personal lives. And when someone does something like this, they have to suffer consequences. And there needs to be uh, real action here by the criminal justice system to make sure there are consequences in this case. The next is Aaron from Politico. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Early Happy New Year. Happy New um, Year, Aaron. I think we're all glad to have this year over with soon. Um, I'm hoping you can just tell us a little more about how the logistics will work in terms of this vaccination campaign. For instance, if we're doing a million shots, what segment of the population do you expect that to get us up to? Will it be anyone over 65 or any essential worker or, or where will that get us up to in the line? And is this going to be by appointment or is it just going to be people line up? Um, and kind of where are the numbers going to come from with, you know, I think you said 45,000 a week at the at the gymnasium type sites that that doesn't add up to a million. So how are okay. you going to hold on? Hold on, Aaron. You got a lot going on there. Let me let me, okay. I'll try and pull out the core of what you're saying. Uh, suffice it to say, our vaccine command center will be constantly providing updates and that the specific how each center will relate to the overall number, how the different categories suffice it to say, you'll be hearing more and more about that with each day to come. I'll turn to Dr. Choksi, but I do not expect him to be able to give you the perfect chart of how all million will be done in January yet. I also want to say uh, at the outset, it's a voluntary effort, meaning uh, you will decide how many people in each category, depending on how many people volunteer in each category. Uh, the more people come forward among healthcare workers or first responders, the faster it goes in those groups. But if fewer people come forward, you move on to other groups. That's what we want to set up, the ability to keep moving to the next group. It is voluntary. I am hopeful, Aaron, that as people see how successful this is, how safe it is, how effective it is, that classic word of mouth thing will happen. More and more people hear from people in their lives, more and more people want it. But we want the ability to jump ahead constantly to the next group. So I can't tell you exactly which groups we're gonna cover because it really depends on that uptick rate. Uh, but what I can say as I turn to Dr. Choksi is the first priority remains. Uh, the folks who are most vulnerable, uh, particularly in settings that have been dangerous like nursing homes, the folks who serve us, who we need to stay safe so they can keep us safe, and then as we work through all those categories, we start out into the general community for the folks who are most vulnerable. Dr. Choksi. Um, sir, you, you said uh, uh, all of the high points. I'm just gonna pull out uh, a couple to um, elaborate on. Uh, one is we're in what's called phase 1A right now. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, this is uh, primarily healthcare workers as well as uh, nursing home staff and residents uh, and, and those in other long-term care facilities. The estimate for New York City is that we actually have a million people just in those categories. Uh, and so our goal uh, of, of uh, putting the one million for January is to be able to say, we want everyone in that category um, who is eligible to get vaccinated uh, to actually have the ability to get vaccinated. Uh, in order to do that, we do have to expand out um, the eligibility from where it is currently, which focuses on hospital workers, uh, as well as nursing home staff and residents. We wanna get to uh, other community-based healthcare workers, including home health workers, for example, and do that as rapidly as possible. And that's the other key point that the mayor has already emphasized, which is, for us to move quickly, um, as is uh, our intent, we have to be able to um, expand the circle of eligibility swiftly as well, so that we can match up the capacity that we have with that eligibility. You know, I wanna also turn to Deputy Mayor Melanie Hartzog, uh, who's done just outstanding work organizing uh, the command center, the vaccine command center, because one of the crucial things here 
is to constantly move with what's going on at the grassroots level and all of these locations. They have to all be tracked and we have to constantly make moves to reach deeper into each population and then go on to the next. So in terms of the work of the command center and how we're structuring that, Deputy Mayor, why don't you jump in? Sure. Uh, good morning, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, just wanted to answer the question a little bit more in detail. We have existing capacity per week for about 150,000 doses. That's through um, hospitals um, system largely. What we're going to be doing over the course of January um, is actually doubling that capacity, um, growing to uh, 300,000 by the end of January. And that includes three major components. Our community vaccination partners, these are our partners who contract, we contract with. They go into community-based organizations, as the mayor talked about, in our hardest hit communities, and we can scale that capacity to 100,000 per week. Then we have our own community hubs. That's another 45,000 um, per week to bring on board. And then our test and trace core, that's going to bring another 4,000. So that's how we get to that overall doubling of capacity. Excellent. Thank you. Go ahead, Aaron. Thank you. Um, and then I also just wanted to ask about, uh, we have a story out today about the 219, I'm oh, sorry, 298 um, city employees who have died from the coronavirus, um, you know, disproportionately black and Latino. Um, and there have been, you know, a number of complaints that, 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 that folks didn't feel that they were well protected enough. Obviously, some of that dates back to, to the spring, but just wondering if there's anything more the city can be doing, especially with this second wave now underway, to protect its own frontline uh, workers. Yeah, we're absolutely adamant about protecting our folks. And look, uh, we lost so many people, and that's why this day of remembrance is so necessary. But let's remember what happened. We all were here alone in New York City. We pleaded back in January for testing. We didn't have it. We didn't even know. We had no way of knowing that throughout February the disease was already spreading widely in the city. Uh, we did not have testing capacity from the federal government. We did not have PPE from the federal government. We were left on our own, and we did our damnedest to reach people and protect people. But um, I think history is going to show very clearly you cannot deal with an international pandemic on a local level. You need support from uh, the national government. And we lost people that had that support been there. Those folks would still be here today. So it's horrible. But the minute we were able to get the information we needed, get the testing we needed, get the PPE supply, we made sure that folks got what they needed and we've continued to build that. That's why we have a reserve now where we have a lot of PPE in stock at all time and why we are constantly working to protect people, most especially by getting them vaccinated. And this brings us right to the urgency of this moment. We need to protect everyone, but we want to vaccinate as many of our frontline public workers as possible, as quickly as possible, so they're safe and their families are safe. Go ahead. The next is Stacy from Fox 5. Hi, good morning, Mr. Mayor, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Stacy. How you doing? I'm well, thank you. Um, knowing that, you know, the city, you're laying out this plan to have a million vaccinated in the next month, you know, there's still this perception among a lot of um, healthcare workers, some of the private healthcare workers we've talked to, some dentists, even the NYPD having their delay in the vaccine, that here in New York, the vaccine is being delayed for these groups where they're seeing their colleagues, you know, other dentists or other pediatricians in New Jersey or Connecticut getting the vaccine. And they're still waiting here, not just to get it, but even to get an update on when they can get it. That's so, right. and knowing, you know, talking about group 1A, about the, the, the healthcare workers and the nursing, care, care, nursing home staff and residents being able to get it in that group. I mean, what about these other healthcare workers who still feel like the city is it, you know, and the state perhaps leaving them behind here. Yeah, Stacy, we're ready. We want to get this done immediately. Uh, I want to see all healthcare workers reached. I want to see all appropriate first responders reached. I mean, there's no question. Uh, the, the more people we reach, the faster, the better. It's just plain and simple. So we need, again, that cooperation all around to just smooth this out and make it simple. But we have amazing capacity in this city. Uh, there's just 
you know, the, the ability of New York City in general is legendary, but our healthcare world in particular uh, showed us in 2020 they could do amazing things in this city. Uh, just, we have the tools. We simply need the right authorizations and we need the supply of vaccine and we can make it work. So everything you're talking about, that can be resolved in the month of January, we get the support we need. We have this very rigorous goal and within that goal is the ability to reach a huge number of healthcare workers and first responders, and that's what I want to see happen. Go ahead. So when you say the support we need, are you referring just to supply of the vaccine? And, and perhaps for Dr. Trotsky, will, you know, dentists and the private healthcare workers, uh, pediatricians, or, you know, even, um, you know, dermatologists, whatever it is, will those doctors be for sure included in the one million in January? Go ahead, doctor. Yes, thank you for the question. And, you know, allow me to answer it by um, by starting with the fact that I'm a primary care doctor myself. And uh, I know uh, that people who have been uh, practicing in the community, whether it's a pediatrician or a dermatologist, um, you know, people have been taking care of patients over the last few months uh, and, um, and uh, doing so with a risk of, of exposure in delivering that care. So I certainly understand um, the need for that prioritization. The state earlier this week um, did uh, issue guidance saying that those community-based uh, healthcare workers, independent providers, um, are eligible for vaccination starting next week. Uh, and so we uh, are prepared to ensure that, um, that those uh, workers will have access to the vaccine beginning uh, next week as well. That will ramp up to uh, the other categories as they get approved by New York State. Uh, I mentioned, for example, home uh, health care workers. Uh, the rest of the health care workforce, which uh, totals um, well over half a million people across New York City. Uh, and so we want uh, those categories to be expanded as quickly as possible so that, again, we can match up our capacity and get them vaccinated as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Go ahead. The next is Katie Honan from the Wall Street Journal. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, and happy New Year, Mayor de Blasio. It's your last year. How do you feel about that? Well, that's not my question. Don't count as a question. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, happy Katie, you caught early. yourself there. I'm impressed. <laughs> don't don't count that. I have much more important questions to ask. So the first one is, I guess, uh, using a sports metaphor, uh, I'll take the uh, pass from Matt Che is, Focusing back on the priority zones that you've identified, some people have criticized it because the, the list was formulated in the summer and it doesn't take into account um, the second wave that we're, we experience in the fall and maybe continue to experience. So will you be adding other places to this, this list or what's the plan there? Yeah, it's a great question, Katie. We're definitely going to look at the uh, reality of the second wave too. Absolutely can add, I think we will add. Um, we wanna look at the whole picture. I will unfortunately remind all of us that what happened in the first wave, uh, indescribably horrible, um, that the second wave has been worrisome, but nowhere near what we went through in the first wave. And we got to really understand that that first wave laid bare where the vulnerabilities are and the amount of people we lost. Uh, and the fact that so much of it had to do with uh, folks who had not had enough health care in their life historically, uh, that's where the danger still is. Uh, so we got to keep focused on that. But absolutely, we're going to look at the neighborhoods and look at the priorities with all the latest data, and we'll make revisions as needed. Go ahead. Katie? Thanks. And my yeah. second question, can, can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? Yep. Sorry. My second one is about this vaccina vaccination plan that you've announced, um, particularly, specifically the using school gymnasiums. Will these be in schools that are open? or will it be in schools that are closed, you know, middle school and high schools, and will that affect any kind of future reopening plan for these schools? Uh, will not affect reopening plans. Uh, what we will do is obviously to be worked out over the coming days, uh, but the fact is that we're gonna use every and any space we need. Uh, that is a part of what the, the city government has and, you know, hospitals, local nonprofits, we're going to use whatever we need, whatever it takes. Uh, and there's lots of ways to put this together in a way that uh, both allows all the other operations to keep going around it, 
but f allows us to get the vaccinations to people who need them. So I'm confident we can strike that balance, but those details will be worked out in the coming days. We have time for two more for today. The next is Yoav from the city. Hi, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to ask Yoav, you sa the, Yoav, you sound like you're at the North Pole, man. What was going on? <laughs> I'm, at, I'm at Lowe's Hardware. Actually. Okay, get, uh, your, get your mouth closer to the phone or something. I can't hear you well. Okay, is this better? Try. Okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to follow up on the DOI report I asked. Um, and the fact that they didn't look into right. the incident where the police car drove into the uh, group of protesters on May 30th. Uh, you said you were going to uh, look into that. Have you had a chance to speak to DOI? I talked to uh, Deputy Mayor Dean Fulahan and asked him to have that conversation with them, and I have not gotten that feedback. Honestly, I'll, I'll check into that today, and we'll get you an answer. Go ahead, Yoff. Um, they, they told me that the way the executive order was written, it instructed them not to do any investigations that would interfere with other investigations, and they're not planning to look into it. Uh, the other issue that I asked about was the internal affairs investigation, and the NYPD told me that they can't, um, they're not going to release that information because of the 50A lawsuit. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, if, is that where things stand, that, that we, we can't find out whether those officers were disciplined or not? Okay, I, I'll do my best as the non-lawyer, you know, I've, I, my last I heard from the law department, uh, that lawsuit still is standing in the way of the disclosure of a, a lot of information we're ready to make public about disciplinary records. I don't believe that that's going to go on that long. I believe at some point this case will be resolved and it will make clear that our ability to release records is now quite clear under the new state law and we will release those records. But I don't think the lawsuit has gotten to the point where we can do it yet. Again, we'll confirm that back to you later today. My goal is abundantly clear. I'm very appreciative that the legislature finally got rid of what was wrong with the 50A law and gave us the ability to be transparent. That transparency about police disciplinary records is going to help us move forward as a city. It's going to help people trust their police. It's going to help us be safer. So I, I am very much looking forward to a day where we can do the fuller release. As soon as we get clearance from the courts, we're going to progress with that. Go ahead. Last question for today it goes to Steve Burns from WCBS 880. Hey, Mr. Mayor, uh, honored, I guess, to have the last questions of 2020 here. Uh, yeah. Happy New Year's Eve to you. So it is a position um, of great honor, Steve. Happy New Year to you. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. I'll try and do it justice. Uh, first, on the vaccine distribution plan, uh, where they've gone so far, hospitals, nursing homes are obviously controlled environments. But when you move them out to, say, a school or public housing lobby, uh, a place where the public can access them, what goes into the verification of knowing that this person is eligible right now, they have the job they say they have? Uh, so when you move it into those public spaces, how do you verify you know, that this is someone who should be getting it right now? It's a good question, Steve. And look, I want to start, and I'll pass to Dr. Choksi, by saying the idea of using whatever spaces will get us out in the communities at the right time again depending on the priorities and as we get through one priority going on to the next going on to the next but the more we get to the grassroots the more success we're going to have reaching people we have to do it in a way that works and you know think about what schools are in every community for example if what we need to do is have people come in on the weekends to a school we can do that you know if we find in a certain case we don't think the school day makes sense we can still do vaccinations on a weekend uh, public housing uh, again you have community centers we can dedicate space specifically for vaccination uh, so i just want everyone to hear the fact that this is only going to work if we get out to the grassroots but we're going to do it in a way that is safe and smart now to the verification of people and uh, their categories i want to state the obvious as i pass to dr choksi anyone who has identification including IDNYC, 
uh, has a birth date on it, and that tells you immediately one of the categories that's going to be a priority, which is older folks. But for other types of priorities, confirming it, Dr. Toxie can give us a flavor of how you're going to do that. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just add a couple of points as well. Um, the first is to build on what the mayor said, you know, between hospitals and uh, what we'll be doing out in the community, including at schools, there are many other access points that, uh, that are also controlled environments, whether they're urgent care centers or uh, pharmacies. Uh, these are the places where the everyday miracle of vaccination happens, whether it's our influenza vaccines or, uh, or vaccines for children. And so we're going to be taking advantage of all of those access points uh, in between uh, those two poles that are described. Um, with respect to eligibility screening, you know, I want to take a step back and just, um, you know, speak to my fellow New Yorkers to say uh, we all need to think about this, yes, as an issue of fairness and justice, uh, but also just think about who is being prioritized and why. Uh, we want nursing home residents uh, to be prioritized because we know they're most at risk. We know uh, we want our healthcare workers prioritized because they are the ones that we are depending upon when we get sick. Uh, and this is an incredibly important message to have um, uh, spread as widely as possible so that people take that into account as they think about where uh, their turn is in line. Um, the state will have uh, some additional uh, requirements with respect to eligibility screening, which of course will be uh, sure to follow. Um, and that will, uh, you know, become more important as we expand out um, the categories, which we hope will happen as rapidly as possible. Thank you. Go ahead, Steve. Thanks. And, and on uh, an entirely different topic, I'm sure you saw the governor uh, is allowing a limited number of fans to see the Buffalo Bills playoff game in a couple of weeks. Uh, and he said that could be a pilot for uh, similar events and venues. Uh, would you be on board if if that kind of uh, pilot program were to be tested, say, at Madison Square Garden or, or a few months down the line at Yankee Stadium or City Field? Would that be something you'd be open to? I, I'm pro-outdoors, uh, anti-indoors is my initial view of the world. I think, I think I've listened to the teachings of Dr. Choksi, and I think he has said a thousand times to me and Dr. Varma and my other colleagues, Dr. Katz, et cetera, outdoors, Crucial difference from indoors, mask on, crucial difference from not having a mask on. As I understand the plan, uh, this is you know, outdoors plus distancing plus mask plus testing. And that's a good thorough plan. That's great. And I am really happy for those Bills fans. And I think the governor did the right thing because uh, it's a thorough plan. But also, you know, as a fan, I can say uh, 25 years is a long time to wait. Uh, to get back to the playoffs, and I know people in Buffalo are really, really uh, excited at this moment. So I think this has been done the right way, the careful way. But with indoors, I would be much more cautious until we get to the point where there's really very, very extensive vaccination. Now, we want to make that, again, happen very aggressively. But uh, I think we got we to gotta walk before we run. Let's get people vaccinated. Then we can start talking about the future of indoor venues. With that, everyone, look. Uh, we're New Yorkers. We're proud. We are often the center of the universe. Tonight, we're definitely the center of the universe. The eyes of the whole world will be on New York City tonight. And it's going to be a joyous night if ever there was one. Goodbye, 2020. Here comes something better, 2021. Uh, I know that when we look back, we're going to say, as painful as the year was, New Yorkers should be proud. Everyone out there, you should be proud. This city showed the world how to be strong, how to be resilient, how to look out for each other. It was an incredible display of all that is good in New York City. 2021, we're going to show people what it looks like to recover, to come back. We're going to do what New York City has done so many times before, to show people not just a comeback, but making things better than they were before, fairer, stronger, more inclusive of all of us. We will do that in 2021. I'm not even saying we can do that. We will do that in 2021. That's who we are as New Yorkers. I have total, total faith in the people of this city. So I cannot wait to get started. We are now just about 13 hours away. It's going to be amazing. And to everyone, 
a very, very happy new year. Feliz año nuevo a todos. Buon ano a tutti. Any language you want to choose of all the languages spoken in this beautiful city, it all says the same thing. We are turning the page and going someplace better. Thank you, everybody.